afternoon with uh, my friend and colleague, again, from the Faculty of Education, Dr. Francois Desjardins. And we're going to have another um, conversation about the questions and comments that arose out of the tutorials for this uh, past week. And we're going to start with one that's a holdover from last week, that is, is there a distinction between group work, cooperation, and collaboration? Is collaboration necessary for problem-based learning, or is problem-based learning necessary for collaboration? Some thoughts, Francois? Yeah, loaded question and under two minutes. Um, okay, the distinction between group work, cooperation, and collaboration, that's, that's the easy part. Uh, group work is, is any time you get a group of, of individuals um, actually uh, working on a task towards a common goal. Uh, now, the distinction, or the interesting distinction, becomes when you start looking at cooperation and collaboration, and this is where group work tends to either work or, or break down. Cooperation um, is very simply when, uh, can be described as, as when a group of people will, will sort of like uh, tackle a common problem, but, but will um, assign themselves each some separate roles or some separate tasks. They will break down the large task or the large uh, uh, the large work to be done into in subtasks and then assign it to, to, to individuals without necessarily um, having everybody having an overall view uh, before or after of the entire global task except maybe a, a, a specific leader. Uh, or even if the entire group has, a, a, has an overall view, they still then just concentrate on their own task without necessarily interacting with the others. Collaboration means that everybody has not only a, a um, a good global view of the problem or the task to begin with, but they all constantly interact with each other towards uh, uh, working on all aspects of solving the problem or, 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 or doing the task, if you want, um, and, or, or, you know, or constructing the project. And this way, this takes advantage really of, of the idea of that collective intelligence and, uh, and all the bits and pieces of knowledge and expertise and, 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 and uh, experience that everyone has. On top of that, you also get everyone getting a chance to offer some resistance, some constructive resistance throughout the process, which will usually make the, the, uh, the end results far stronger. Is it necessary for problem-based learning? I would suggest that it absolutely is critical for problem-based learning. And the problem is learning is, is not necessary for collaboration to occur, because you can collaborate without necessarily having a problem. Um, but you, you, for, for problem-based learning, doing it uh, um, in, in a cooperative manner is equivalent to doing it in, a, in an isolated, individualistic manner. And, and you, you, you miss out, if you want, on the entire possibility of getting other people's views and, and uh, input, but also of having to um, uh, face actual refutation, if you want, attempts by, by others, which would actually make the, the conjectures and, and, and the move forwards much stronger. And obviously, I'm using conjecture and refutation in the Popperian or Karl Popper sense, which I'm sure Roland will give you the reference at one point or another. Um, but it's, it's, it's that idea of, of collaboration, meaning that you get both sides of the, of the, of the problem being looked at by, by a group of people. And therefore, what is being moved forward ends up being far, far stronger. I would suggest that, that actually cooperating on problem-based learning um, is actually pointless. Um, okay, going on to the next question. The, the next question is actually sort of an amalgam of what uh, showed up um, on in these discussion notes after the tutorials, and then I added a little bit to it um, uh, towards the end. So we'll just talk, take a look at, at uh, teaching as a whole to begin with. So teaching would be making sure that learning is occurring in the classroom. Um, and what was added, meaning that the students are actually retaining the information. So, of course, what we're talking about there is a definition of learning that's embedded. So, learning becomes, according to that that um, that second phrase, uh, learning is a retention of information. Um, and then I added in, logically then, if learning is an internal process, in other words, inside of our minds, how does the teacher ensure that learning is occurring? Um, is it even possible? Um, you want to tackle that one, or shall I add in the next question to defining teacher? Because it's related. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that one, and, and, and I'll actually have a look at the, at the second one at the same time, uh, which is, you know, can it, the defining teacher, can okay. a more knowledgeable other be a thing if not a person? Um, the, the, the whole idea of teaching, uh, making sure that learning is occurring, you can't make sure of anything as a teacher. Um, let's face it, if, if, if we, if we uh, agree, and there seems to be consensus today, actually since probably the last two or three thousand years, 
that anything that is, that is uh, however we define learning, it is within the mind that it occurs. Um, if, whether you look at it from a cognitivist or behaviorist or whatever, it, learning occurs within the mind. And having said this, at best, at best, and even the most behavioral approaches will, will uh, agree to this, at best, you may be able to um, create a situation where you can get some, some predictive behaviors from, a, from an individual, um, but you, will, you can never make sure that any kind of learning is occurring um, within the minds of the learners. From a constructivist or social constructivist or connectivist perspective, whichever other perspective you want to take it, um, the, the, the best that teacher can do is, is set up situations, um, set up problems, uh, create a context, create an environment, and, and um, even create some, some uh, situations that would promote some dialogue, if you want, or promote some action that would foster some learning, possibly. And in the Godskin sense, um, if, you, if, if, uh, uh, if you want, you may be uh, able to help a learner that's in the process of tackling a specific task by offering them some additional information or offering them some help in the form of information, in the form of demonstrations, or even in the form of questions sometimes to, to, to lead them into a, a process. But the learning process is entirely owned by the learner. Having said this, is, um, does this mean that, that the students are actually retaining the information? No, it's, learning is not about retaining information because you, if you just consider retaining information, you stack, it's, it's, it's equivalent to stacking of piles and piles of books, but I mean, uh, there's no structure to it. You can't find anything. Learning is more about having a cognitive structure, a structure of the knowledge that you do have, that an organization, a structure in which you can not only find stuff, but also that you can use stuff in, 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 in the sense that whatever you've got up there. And to be able to use it, you have to have these preferred paths. You have to create these preferred paths. The, the, the knowledge, the, the, the information that you have has to fit together. It has to agree it together. It, it has to be consistent. It has to be coherent. And when you acquire new knowledge, if you're just going by memory, then it doesn't affect the rest of your knowledge. If you're actually learning whatever is coming in that's new, you get these aha moments. What's an aha moment or a eureka? It's when this new piece that is unknown is recognized so it matches something else that you've got in there, and it actually then fits in your cognitive structure and actually shakes it up a little bit and maybe modifies what you've had before, as well as adding something to it. So it's not just an accumulation of retaining inf retained information. It is a, 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 a modification of the existing structure that, that's, uh, that occurs when new stuff also comes in. So can the teacher just be uh, somebody that, that, that makes sure that this occurs? No, the teacher has, has to do something different. First of all, they can't make sure, they can foster it. And, and, and then the second part, can they be a more knowledgeable other in the sense, in sense of kind of slideshow or virtual tutoring, you know, play a role of, of the teacher? Not really. They can be information that can be accessed by the learner, but these inanimate objects, if you want, or even if they are highly interactive and so on and so forth, and they've got all these predicted reactions built into them because they're software and they're made to, uh, uh, they're made to run on computers and whatnot, um, they still cannot, how could I put this? Um, they still cannot go inside the learner's head and add something or modify something. The best these pieces can do, much like the teacher, is to create a context. Um, so it, it's, it's when you're defining teaching, you, we have to back off a little bit in terms of saying, well, the teacher is one that makes, uh, makes it possible for the learner to learn. No, because as far as I'm concerned, learners can learn without teachers, but teachers can't teach without learners to begin with. Um, and, and just having access to all this other information is good for the learner, but it, is not, it does not play the role of a teacher who is the one uh, that can recognize, if you want, when the learner is going outside that, that, uh, that, that potential tone of experience, if you want. It's a little bit, the last quick example, um, the, 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 a good teacher, if you want, is not somebody who pushes the student and gives them the right answers. A good teacher is, the, is a, 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 a teacher that uses pedagogy appropriately, is one that recognizes when the learner goes outside uh, what will, is, is likely, the, the experience that, that, are, that are likely to lead them outside of what the target knowledge and the target competencies to be developed are, and that will do something to bring them back within the potential realm of the experiences that they, that they can go through that will lead them to the actual um, 
uh, target knowledge that, that you want. But the one thing that the teacher can do is as long as the student is within that, that, that cone, if you want, of, of potential things that will lead them to the learning, they can't force them through that. It's impossible. The, the next question, I'm going to skip over to the last question in a second because it seems the most appropriate at this point in time. So given that we were talking then about a teacher setting a context within which learning can, uh, can occur, can you make a link to the structuring of the video, uh, video case context situation or settings within the PBLOs and how do those actually play a role in this learning kind of uh, piece that we're dealing with? Um, and the, the, the second question that seemed to come up out of the, um, uh, the discussion was how can we build a context to ensure that the problems that we want to be addressed are included or should we even try? And that last piece was my, my attempt to, to introduce uh, some possibilities that there, there is something else going on. Okay, um, structuring a video case, context, situation, settings, yes, the PBLOs are, are designed to, to, to exactly do that. It, the, my only major objection is, is any time we say we want to ensure, and that's a typical teacher kind of, of approach, we want to make sure that something occurs. Sorry, you can't, all right? Just forget it, don't try, and, and, and as soon as we get off that boat, we're, 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 we'll, we'll be okay. Uh, now, can the PBLOs actually be useful? Yes, they can be useful in the sense that the, the structure of the PBLO presents a problem, it's, it's always an artificial kind of situation if you want, uh, but it still presents a context in which a, a, a problem has to be, it has to be teased out if you want. And the kinds of questions that a PBLO presents initially, the, the analysis kinds of questions and the synthesis kinds of questions at the end, are, are really structured and designed if you want to, to help the learner uh, sort of like focus on what are the kinds of questions I, I should be or I could be asking. And, and by going through many PBLOs, eventually what happens is, is, is a, a student, if you want, can, can eventually sort of like start getting used to understanding what what the, those kind of, what are the kinds of questions I should be asking when faced with a problem initially or faced with a situation that I think is problematic and how would I actually be able to get the problem out of there through an analysis process and the kind of reflection that that the kind of that the PBLO can promote is very likely or is uh, how can I put it very conducive to this kind of reflection. But what the PBLO can do, sorry, and, and it was never the pretext that, that, uh, that it did that, is, is that it that is no way going to ensure that that process occurs, okay? Even with a teacher present, n nobody can ensure that that process occurs. Now, put the PBL in the context where you've got a group of students working together. I think that probably is the best possible mix you can get because you will have different perspectives looking at the same situation, different perspectives looking at the questions and coming up with different answers. And it's in that discussion dialogue analysis process that you are more likely than not to get learning to occur because people will have their own kind of structures shaken up by other people's re uh, uh, questions. That's something that will be highly constructivist, social constructivist. Uh, we'll stay within Vygotsky's zone of proximal development because the other learners are of equivalent uh, uh, level and so on and so forth. That is the, the best possible scenario you can come up with. The teacher can be present or not, unimportant, okay? But does that mean that the uh, video cases actually uh, replace the teacher? No, they don't. They were never intended to replace the teacher. They are merely uh, a well-structured additional tool to help the teacher present a context of a problem and c containing potentially a problem to solve. It's basically like in medicine where they do problem-based learning, they come up with these uh, fictitious cases that they come up with. Now, here's a person walking in your office with these kinds of things, give us a diagnosis. Well, the PBLOs, in a sense, approach it from the same kind of perspective. I don't know if that answers your question. I think we're about running out of time, um, so thank you very much again, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, do this a couple more times before the course is ended. So thank you very much. Absolutely. With pleasure. Ciao.